Hi, I'm Andreas Teichmann Whiteley, and I'm here to show you uh, highlights of our latest Vistory version 1.3 that is now publicly available. Uh, a quick summary of what we've done in Story 1.3 it is uh, we've made massive uh, improvements uh, in the timeline editing experience for the user, so massive usability experiences, some of them I will highlight. We've spent a lot of time on audio control, advanced audio control, and also making use of Story's unique architecture to connect audio tracks to the destination, so you can have multiple destinations with multiple languages, for example. I will show you that as well. And we're going to go slightly into Template Builder, which is now supported by Vistory 1.3. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on Template Builder because there will be separate feature videos for that uh, component, but I want, you to, show, I want to show uh, what it's all about. So let's uh, have a look at the client. Uh, we're going to start with opening, a, a, creating a new story. So a new story version 1.3 highlight. Uh, and you might straight away notice that the timeline looks slightly different. That's because we've redesigned the entire timeline to ma make it look better, function better, um, and just generally give a better user experience. You'll, you see straight away I'm doing things that was previously not possible, like resizing a timeline. Um, so I'm quickly going to go over some of the usability improvements that we've done. So I'm gonna, going to add one video to the main track. You'll notice immediately we have a waveform displayed on the video track now. That was previously not visible, which would help a lot to see that where is the sound um, um, currently being played. And uh, on the left side, you see a lot of labels here that depict what those labels are for. So we have an overlay track, a main track, and an audio track. There are some functions on the left here that allow you to uh, affect the preview, like turning off some preview or muting some audio, etc., etc. Uh, let's add some graphics so you can also see what that looks like. So now we have a graphics track over here called Lower Thirds. It's, it's a new slick design, uh, improved to make it clearer what's what on the timeline. And the same for audio, if I just grab so that we have some different things on the timeline to look at. Down below the video, this was a very long audio, so I can just right click, stretch it to the end so that it nicely matches the video. And you can see that overall the color scheme has also changed. This is uh, done in collaboration with the UX team to make sure that it's clear uh, what you're doing while you're editing your story. Now, uh, usability improvements include, among others, snapping on the timeline, which is uh, not something that was supported in the previous version. So now I did a cut on the audio, and if I move this, it automatically snaps together so you don't get any gaps in your audio, and that goes the same for graphics or overlay track videos and images. Um, <clears throat> there's no mode or anything to turn off or on with snapping, it just snaps once and if you don't want it to snap you just keep going and it will not snap again until you release it and try again. We try to avoid going into separate modes and as you may remember in 1.2 we had separate modes, we had audio mode and we had panning mode. We have done away with those because you would have to go into one mode to do audio, go out of that to resize and move, and then go into panning, etc. It was quite cumbersome, we found, after usability testing. So we decided to redesign that experience so you can do everything at the same time. And you can see that when I, uh, you see Chris over here, he's talking, and uh, we've shown before that you're able to move the video around to make sure that you can see where uh, the, the interesting areas of the video. And that is called panning, and we can do panning keyframing for interpolation. Now, we've shown this before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But I just added the panning keyframe. You can see a little orange thing down here. And previously, this was like a mode. You had to go in there to do this kind of thing. But now we're still in the same UI. I'm still able to resize the item, or if I cut it, uh, move it around without having to go in and out a, a certain mode. And that goes also for audio keyframing. Now, again, this is not a new feature, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it looks slightly different. You'll see that when I click this button over here, I show the audio frames, and here you are able to keyframe. Uh, the audio for phase in, fade out, etc. And notice how you still have the panning keyframe visible. So you're still able to move the item around in the same mode. And this is one of the biggest UX improvements we've done on the timeline. Just making sure you can do everything at any time without having to go in and out a certain mode by button presses. But that's, uh, that's enough about the usability. There's also some smaller improvements here and there that you'll notice when uh, using the application. So I'm just going to turn this one off for a second. Let's focus uh, on one other feature I want to highlight. Now, we are trying, we've, we've made Story 
an application that's easy and fast to use, and that's what we keep doing as well. But we also listen to feedback of the more experienced NLE editors uh, that are missing some features that, that completely makes sense to be in a product like this. One of such is the JKL feature where you're able to use the JKL keys to quickly navigate a story. Now we've implemented support in that 1.3 as well, and that basically means you're able to go backwards in time by just using the keyboard. And you'll see that the CTI is currently moving really fast. The, fa the more I press on, on J, the, the faster back it goes. The more I press on L, the faster forward it goes. Uh, and K will, uh, will stop the video. Now this is a very common way of navigating videos in the NLE world. We've also added support for this world for those who are used to that kind of workflow. Let's move on to, um, to audio. Now, we've, we've gotten a lot of feedback on the previous versions, very valuable feedback about the audio experience. We noticed quite fast that just a couple of audio tracks below a video is not enough. There's, uh, there's use cases for having multiple languages, there's use cases for uh, many different audio tracks that need to go to different destinations. Now, we've listened and we've added that to our product. So, we're gonna have a look at that. Now, when I was previously playing, or I haven't done it yet, I'm just gonna remove the music so we don't get distracted by the music. When I start playing this, right now you actually hear German, not English, as you would expect from my colleague Chris Black. And that is because I currently have selected a destination that is configured to only pick the audio tracks left and right for the German voiceovers that we have prepared together with the video. And we also have French and obviously English available. And I just want to show you how that looks because I can play the video. I swap it to French and on the fly it will swap the language. So the person that is preparing the content doesn't even need to worry about the languages. This is all configured beforehand. And you just need to worry about the content. It looks good. And the languages are taken care of beforehand. You notice that there, it isn't really visible in the UI. And that is done on purpose. By default, it's, it's a pretty complicated thing and we want to keep it simple. However, there may be plenty of use cases where you want to go in there, have a look at what the audio tracks look like, maybe even move them around if some of them get misplaced or if you're using content that comes from a different location. So if I press on advanced mode over here in my timeline options menu, then you'll notice that suddenly a lot more pops up. And this is what's actually going on. And you'll see on the left side here, these are my audio tracks that I have defined, <coughs> excuse me, as part of the system. <coughs> and this list is completely custom, customizable. So this is just an example that we have prepared. We have English left, right, German left, right, French left, right, and natural for music or voiceover or something else. Now you notice that while I have French turned on, we hear French, I swap to English, you see that the French left and right disables and English enables. And you're able to do everything in here to customize. You're able to move them around. For example, English is in the wrong track. I'm able to move it to another track like natural left, for example. And you see that it pops up there. Now that doesn't make much sense to put it there. So I'm going to put it back again. Also, these files are individually deletable. If you don't need the audio from that line, from that track, they're also keyframable separately. So each segment, each audio segment and track are separately keyframable for, for, for fade in, fade out, etc. It's a very powerful feature that is designed to be easy to understand so that the people, the person that is editing the story doesn't need to worry about it, but still with the flexibility to go in there and make any changes you need to do. Now, I'll, um, when, I, when we move on to the next uh, highlight I want to do, I'll just do a quick publish so that while it's uh, transcoding, we can uh, talk about the next feature. And you'll notice that I added uh, three little icons here to make it easy to understand that these three uh, destinations, uh, publishing targets, these are just going to go to a local disk, are those languages. So we're just gonna pick these three over here, the three languages, and we're gonna go and transcode those. Now, while these are going, <clears throat> we're gonna move on and talk a little bit about Template Builder. Now, I don't want to spend too much time, like I mentioned previously, uh, but the Story 1.3 supports the full Template Builder workflow. Now, Template Builder is a component that we have released together with Pilot Edge of, um, earlier this year. Uh, and it, it is aimed to customize or allow you to customize the fill-in form for graphics. Now, I'll, I'll go to Template Builder and show you what that's all about. And a few small quality of life settings you can affect the, the duration and some constraints of graphics on the timeline, which can be very useful. 
Now, for example, you'll notice this is a very simple example. We now have a graphic where uh, sports related graphics with uh, an update and uh, just some, some lower third uh, graphics. And this text is, um, has some default values that are editable through Template Builder. It has a label, it has a tooltip, and all those are completely definable by yourself. Also the order of the fields, etc. But in addition to that, you're also to allow, able to completely take over the UI by using custom HTML templates. Now again, I'm not gonna go into that too much, but I want to show you. So this, I just brought up, I just swapped to another tab, Template Builder, also a web application, same as Vistory, same as Pilot Edge. So you're able to open it in any web, web browser as long as you have a connection. And uh, here we're immediately greeted with, uh, with an open template window. So I'm just gonna grab, uh, for example, this NB wipe over here and open it up. Now we get a preview that happens to be empty for this one because it's a, it's a wipe effect. So I'm just gonna browse a little bit into it and you see that it gives you different moments of the graphic. Uh, and you'll notice, uh, this is actually a bad example because it doesn't have any fields. So I'm just gonna grab another one. Uh, let's do, actually, let's do this one. And then I see something that I need to go take away. <clears throat> there. All right. So I just opened a template where we've actually used one of the custom HTML templates that we created ourselves to make the editing experience or the filling experience for the user easy without having to worry about it. So when you look at the graphic, you may notice there's a lot of data here. We have a text there. We have lots of numbers here of height and weight and all that kind of thing, name, pictures. It is a lot of data in a graphic that for a soccer player. And that kind of data you don't want to manually fill in. It's just way too cumbersome to do that. It takes too much time. You want to just quickly do some data integration or something similar to make sure that you don't have to manually type in these values. Now, that's what we did with the custom HTML example here. What we did was we added a HTML panel, which you can do in with right-clicking and then adding a HTML panel. And then this panel down here allows you to define the URL to your HTML file. Now this HTML file, we have complete control over. You can do, use whatever web technology you like, um, and you can do whatever you want to do with it and make it look however you want to do. Now it looks here like it's part of our application, but it actually is completely on the outside. And uh, together with that, maybe you're replacing many of the auto-generated film form that we supply with the product, so you're able to hide as well uh, certain fields so you don't have a double. And I'm just gonna unhide that because I've done that previously. Then down here, you see that a lot more popped up. And this is all the data manually. This is the auto-generated fill in form that we generate based on the template. And you can see this is quite cumbersome to go through every time for a different player. So we've replaced it and then we can hide all of these fields because we don't need them. And then we can just, for example, just say, okay, I want Neymar. You just press on Neymar, and then we have the custom HTML template fetching some data, and then you see all the values have updated in one go. And this is the typical example of why you'd want to make use of custom HTML feature. It's, it's extremely powerful. You can do a lot of great data integration with it, but also just taking over control over the user experience of the journalist filling in content. Now, I'm not gonna go over all the features in Tumblr Builder. There's lots of good stuff there. There will be other videos covering that. But one thing I want to highlight, which is important for story, is something in the settings here, which is called duration. And this allows you to set a default duration for graphics and some constraints, minimum and maximum. It can be very useful for some graphics that are not designed to be longer than four seconds. Then you want to set that kind of constraint in here. And we'll just use this graphic as an example. So I'm gonna set a default of five seconds, a minimum of two seconds, and say a maximum of 10 seconds. Now these are just random numbers but I just want to highlight that this also works. So I'm going to save this template. Now I need to remember this one, SM Player Profile 20. I'm going back to story. I don't need to reload the clients. There's no need for that. I just go to the Find Graphics app and find the exact same template. So I think it was this one. I drag it down to my timeline. And by default, you notice that it has exactly five seconds duration. And when I'm resizing it, I'm not able to go further than a minimum of two, and I'm not able to go further than a maximum of 10. So it just allows you to give some constraints to the graphics on the timeline to make sure that the graphic is not stretched longer than intended or made shorter than intended, and also give some meaningful default values. Now we can have a look at uh, if the transcoding is done, so we can have a look to see if those uh, three different language uh, destinations I've set up are done. Now they're finished. So we can have a quick look at the results. 
And uh, here's a little demo portal that, uh, that we've prepared ourselves. This is the story version 1.3 highlight that I've done and the three version that, uh, that we've uh, published. Now, normally we would do something like this and play them all at the same time, but that will not sound very nice because you hear three languages at the same time. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go back and just quickly show you that all three of them have a different language. Yeah, so being here in Media So there's City Chris talking, full TDM, HD, everything looking staff. good. The state of the orchestra. Let's go to portrait. There we have our French, as configured, and Square should be German. There we go. There you see that we have three versions of the same video with three different languages. Now, note that this is just our example. You don't have to use it for languages. You can also use, if your house format or, form or the video files that you've uploaded contain a voiceover track, a background noise track, left, right, that type of thing, also fully supported. You'll decide yourself how it gets down next into the final result. Um, I want to highlight one more quick thing that I forgot to mention earlier. The overlay track on the timeline that is also pre uh, there in previous versions now also supports panning and audio keyframing. That was something that didn't make it in the previous version. That means that when I have a portrait version, and I want to move this video around on the overlay track. That's something that was not possible. I want to quickly mention we have fixed that. That is now in there as well. And that concludes my Vistory 1.3 highlights. And thank you for watching.